Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic dear to my heart, child inclusive mediation. Devorah Greenberg has kindly agreed to join me today to answer my questions on the topic and to share her experience in the field. Devorah is a fully qualified and accredited mediator with extensive experience working with adults and children as part of divorce and separation. She's a member of the Family Mediation Association, as well as a family mediation member of Resolution. Devorah, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chloe. It's lovely to be here with you. I wanted to start by a bit of level setting. For those of our listeners who aren't familiar with mediation, could we start by just explaining to them the principles of family mediation and what exactly you do? Yeah, sure. Well, when people decide that they're going to separate or divorce, they have a kind of spectrum of options available to them as to how they can work out the practical arrangements that need to happen. So most of the time people are going to they know that they've got to divide and split their assets and finances somehow yeah and so often parents are going to want to work out children's arrangements when are the children going to be with each each one of them yeah and those two can kind of dovetail you know where are we going to live and how are we going to get kids from a to b etc mm-hmm. so when they work those out they can they've got this range of options i always speak to clients about it like on this side They've got a really collaborative conversation over the kitchen table um, with a cup of tea. You know, let's yeah. we realize this isn't working. Let's try and troubleshoot together. Let's try and work out how we're going to move forward. Mm-hmm. I think that's quite rare. I mean, Chloe, you would tell me in your experience. It's, it's difficult rare. to put it it's that way. A divorce is such an emotional time um, and such a weighty time. So often they will need the help of professionals. Mm-hmm. And once they kind of leave that domain of the kitchen table, they've got a range of options mm-hmm. before they hit sort of the court process yeah, and a judge making the decision. So when you've got that spectrum on one hand, we're making the decisions, we're just going to talk about it collaboratively on our own. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, you've got a judge who's going to decide all of those things that needed to be decided for us. Yeah. Next to the kitchen table, you've got mediation and mediation is quite specific. It's quite unique in that um, it sort of rests on certain principles, which mm-hmm. make it differ from the other options available. Yeah. So I'll do a kind of whistle stop tour of all the options. That'd and then I'll, great. Pan, yeah. in, I'll pan in on, on, um, on mediation itself. So you've got mediation similar to kitchen table with professionals. I'll go into detail in a minute. Otherwise, if that wouldn't work, and people felt they needed more support, they might need solicitor negotiations. Mm -hmm. There are many, many excellent solicitors who practice what's called collaborative law. Yeah, That's a sort of round table discussion, a bit like mediation, but where each client has their solicitor kind of next to them, Mm -hmm. protecting them um, and looking out for their interests. And then you've got other options such as private arbitration, private FDR, early neutral evaluations, all kinds of, there's all kinds of kind of products out there now, which again, I'm sure you would be telling your clients about as options if they don't necessarily want to jump into the civil court process Mm -hmm. and they don't want to go into that kind of jungle, but they don't feel that they're able to mediate. So um, let's look at mediation. Mediation is voluntary. So if at any point both clients or one client said this isn't working, then they can walk away. So it's unlike the court process where if somebody summons to court, they're obviously legally duty bound to attend. Yeah. Rather, um, they can decide at any point in the process whether they want to mediate. So it's voluntary. Mm-hmm. Uniquely, mediators are impartial. We do not represent one client to the other. Mm-hmm. That can be really, really good because we can hold clients sort of together to have those collaborative conversations to make decisions together Mm -hmm. it does work obviously if one of the clients or both the clients feel they don't have a voice in the room or feel disempowered to express their opinions or feel that they simply need more support so we will be you know in the middle kind of chairing the discussion and holding the discussions for them so it's voluntary we're impartial It's confidential. It stands alone. The discussions, the content of this discussions are privileged, which means they can't be shown to a judge in court. Mm -hmm. Gets a bit technical. I won't go into too many of the sort of exceptions and caveats to confidentiality other than the obvious ones, which is safeguarding or fees of crime. We we wouldn't be able to mediate if people were um, doing anything illegal. So it's voluntary, we're impartial and it's confidential. And then the big, the big, 
really wonderful part of mediation is it's the clients who design their own settlement. They make the decisions. Mm -hmm. It isn't another person, potluck on the day, what judge you get, making the decision for you and then imposing that decision on you, whether it works or not. You, the clients, have the opportunity to say, well, let's think it through. Let's try this out for a month or two. Then let's come back Mm -hmm. and see if it did work. Let's work, hone it, fine tune it. So it's really the clients who make the decisions and they're the architects. So that's that's my whistle stop tour of mediation in general. And what we are doing is we're slotting ourselves in to the negotiations and creation of the settlement part Mm -hmm. at the end of the mediation journey, we will then create documents for clients where they can then go back into the hands of a solicitor, get their settlement made into a consent order and have it endorsed by a judge kind of at the same time as they might be applying for their final order. So we're attempting to help people tread lightly on the legal system. Yeah. Both in emotions, cost and time. Thank you, Devorah. That that makes a lot of sense. And that range of options that you've described, it's something that I'm always surprised when I discuss it with my clients. They don't seem to know about all that middle part. You know, they they think always of kitchen table or court, and they don't know about all those other options. Um, So it's great to be able to educate them on that. Yeah. Uh, What I would add, actually, sorry, while I remember, is that um, I think there's also there's a difference in the mediation room. We're not therapists. And although many, many mediators are retired lawyers, we're not lawyers, we can't give legal advice like a solicitor can, but yeah. we we have a therapeutic um, slant to the way the discussions happen. It's a softer environment and we give clients tons and tons of legal information. So we can give them information, we just can't give them advice. Understood. Thank you. That that's really helpful. I think it, it sets a good um, a good basis for our conversation, and, and and actually, it's a good segue into my next question, which is focusing in on child inclusive mediation and what does that mean, and what do you do in that context? Yeah. So, child inclusive mediation is based on the principle that it is a human right for children, based on the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child, mm-hmm. Article Twelve. If anyone's interested, <laughs> um, a child has the right to hear their voice heard, to have their voice and their opinions heard if decisions are being made about them. So I'm saying it slowly to you because it's kind of a a, a nuanced point. It's important that a child feels that the adults making those decisions wanted to hear from them, but it's equally important that the child doesn't feel those decisions are being imposed on them. They don't have the weight of decisions on their shoulders, but the adults rather who are making those decisions are saying to their child, you're important to us. We know this is going to be an earthquake and a massive sort of seismic transition for you. We'd love to hear the things that are concerning you, worrying you, your hopes, um, you know, for how this might look and your worries about what, because we want to take that into consideration Mm -hmm. when we are making decisions. Does that make sense? It does. So, so, so at a practical level, it, does this mean you meet with the child on their own or together with their parents? How does that usually work? Yeah. So I've described to you kind of, I guess, the principle that it's based on. Process is um, quite interesting. If, let's say, I'm doing a broader mediation, put the child to one side now with, um, let's call them Bob and Mary. We're doing a mediation. We've got Bob and we've got Mary and we're discussing, we've discussed finances and we're now thinking about children's arrangements. Yeah. Or... We might actually do child inclusive mediation right at the beginning of the process, whatever's important for parents. It's a very organic process Mm -hmm. and they guide that. So at some point in the process, we will insert as a separate um, journey, if you like, this child inclusive mediation sort of section. And it involves me meeting with the parents first and introducing the concept to them and us sort of thinking collaboratively and together, well, how could... How would it be nice for the children? Would they like to meet me together, separately, in school, at home, somewhere else? What would be their... So we'll discuss sort of how it's going to work. Yeah. Then I will meet the children or children separately or child um, in whichever way it works for them. Sometimes I meet the person, sometimes we're on Zoom, really whatever is the child's comfort level. Um, The expectation is that children on the age of 10 and above will be asked and invited to a child inclusive mediation session. We do have children in the room who are younger. 
often we have children in the room who are younger if they're kind of just podded on to older siblings yeah. because we want them to know that they were invited mm-hmm. and that they could take part. You know, often someone's just kind of eating a biscuit in the corner, you know, <laughs> not really, not necessarily hugely engaged, but at least having a positive experience about who are mummy and daddy talking to and what's this going to be. Yeah. So the meeting itself is about, it can be anything, Chloe, from sort of 20 minutes, especially when I get a very silent child. It's more like a 20 minutes yeah. and it can extend really to however long they want. The sort of usual max is, is around an hour. Okay. And that's often if I've got older children who are able to kind of really want to use the space to think things through. Yeah. If I've got younger children, if they're shy, I've got games that I play with them just to help them kind of articulate and think about any worries they might have or any kind of things that they want to describe to their mum and dad. Mm-hmm. Now, it's quite important that a both mum and dad have agreed to this it yeah. has to have both parents consent b the children agree to this Makes so sense. the child has to give their consent as well and then during the session I'll explain to them that it's confidential that I don't need to tell anything to anyone if they don't want me to yeah. but that I can give messages to their parents if they would like mm-hmm. and I have a range of responses on this I've had children who say brilliant you know can you tell mum I don't like broccoli soup (laughs) and I've had children who are really trying to work out what their week's going to look like what the proximity to school is how they'll get to their extracurricular activities or they might just say to me you know can you tell mummy and daddy I hate it when they fight Mm. or something that sort of simple so yeah or they might say I don't want to feed back anything yes it, it is not the point of this is actually not the feedback to the parents. The point of this is that the child has their voice heard, that they have a space to be able to express themselves. And also they might want to learn about what's going on. They might, they might be asking me questions. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So sorry, I'm kind of going into a lot of detail, but that's sort of the way the meeting looks with the children or with the child. And then there's a separate feedback meeting with mum and dad yeah so you this kind of three-part project in a way mm-hmm. introduction where I make sure that both parents are consenting to this and we talk yeah. about how it's going to happen meeting with child or children and then feedback session now feedback session I will feedback what the child has allowed or children have allowed me to feedback yeah. if they haven't then we will think about why that was why don't they feel comfortable yeah. for mum and dad to hear these messages what what might be weighing on their shoulders so in general I find parents find it informative whatever the feedback I'm not surprised yeah so that's I think that, yeah. that's pretty much the principles isn't it that and makes a lot of sense yeah thank you and and how do you manage the child's expectations with regards to the impact of their uh, their opinion on on the decision making yeah it's a really good question I'm super clear right at the beginning who I am, what my role is, and what I can do with these kids and what I can't do with these kids. And also, firstly, because then their expectations are managed. And secondly, because then the weight is not on their shoulders. They might think they're as well. And I'm going to say, you know, Joe, who do you want to live with? And I'm not going to be saying that. I'm not going to be putting any decisions on them. And I'll and I'll express that to them. Yeah. I'll say, Joe. You don't need to worry. There's going to be no decisions asked of you. This is just an, an, an available space for you to ask questions or express, explore together how it's going for you. What's going on in your life and how's it going? And what are your thoughts? And would you like me to share anything with mom and dad? So it's a very informal meeting. And I'll speak to parents before about if we're meeting in person, appropriate snacks and what do they enjoy doing and try and make it as kind of human and relaxed as possible for the kids. Thank you so much, Devorah. That makes a lot of sense. And actually, that takes me quite nicely to my next question, which you've touched upon. But what Mm. are the benefits of child inclusive mediation? And what would you tell people who are considering it? I have touched upon it, but I'm going to articulate it very clearly. Mm -hmm. The most important benefit is that children in this overwhelming and nerve wracking transitional process have their voice heard if they want to be heard. The benefits range from a child being offered child inclusive mediation by mum and dad and saying, no, thanks, but it's really nice that you asked me. Mm 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Don't want it. Don't want to speak to Devorah Greenberg or any, you know, adult about this. But I really, really, in their emotional kind of bank account, it will be known in their hearts. Mum and dad did offer me this. They did want to hear how I'm feeling. So benefit number one, even just being asked. Yeah, that really matters. Yes, no, it is a cathartic and therapeutic experience to have your voice being offered to have your voice heard. Mm -hmm. Number two, being in the room, having a therapeutic conversation with somebody who's a professional, who's not mum and dad. So you don't have the weight of, golly, if I say this to mum, will it hurt her? Or if I say this to dad, will it hurt him? Or if I say this to dad, will it hurt mum? If I say this to mum, will it hurt dad? There are so many worries in children's hearts as they see their parents separating. And it's good for them to have the opportunity to speak to somebody who's seen this many times before, has a kind of understanding of what the roadmap might be, mm -hmm. and also can just hear what they want to say and possibly be the conduit to feed it back if they want. So yeah. the therapeutic benefits for the child are huge. Then there are also practical benefits. So mm -hmm. practical for the child, let's go from the child's point of view, practical benefits for the child are that if I don't like broccoli soup, mum now knows. Yeah. Or if I am worried about my maths homework on a Tuesday night being left at dad's, they now know they can have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And my agenda can, I feel that my agenda is in a practical sense being taken care of. That's been lifted off my nine-year-old shoulders, 11-year-old shoulders. I can just worry about my GCSEs now because I know mum and dad, they've, they're holding me. They've got it. So that's one massive benefit for the child. For sure. For the parents... It's a, an amazing benefit because it can inform their settlement discussions. Again, I will explain to children, if, if children say I definitely want to live in Glasgow, it, it, it's a must for me. I will manage their expectations, as you asked me before. I'm, I will say, I don't know if that's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to be a realistic thing for mommy and daddy, but I'm going to let them know that that's really a big, that would be a game changer for you. So mm -hmm. yeah parents can then take that information and have it inform their discussions it's not the deciding factor the child knows that and the parents know that but it will inform the way they are they sort of um design the arrangements for the child mm -hmm. and are there any scenarios where you would recommend not doing child inclusive mediation yes yeah often actually um examples are obvious ones if the child is too young yeah. And um, they're on their own. So they're not kind of podded to a more organic conversation with older children. If they're just a six year old on their own, I wouldn't do it. OK, probably wouldn't do it unless it was an extremely precocious child. But I, I, I wouldn't do a six year old, but I would do a six year old and a nine year old. Yeah. Let's say, or a nine year old and offer to the six year old. You know, I, I would I would urge past those boundaries. But really, if they're too young. It's just a lot of pressure for them and they don't really necessarily understand how to use it. Um, so A, age, B, capacity, um, which is obvious if they don't have the capacity to have the discussions and gain and benefit from it. C would be, um, just trying to think, if they've had a lot of therapy, if they're seeing a lot of professionals, if they've already gone through the court process and they've already been interviewed by Kafkas and they are just full of it, they are tired, I would probably say they don't need to meet somebody else, another well-meaning adult messing, you know, sort of nudging into their world. Yeah. I, would, I would probably say leave it. And the benefits you mentioned earlier about being heard already being had because they're being heard possibly, through other avenues. Sledgehammered, you know, yeah. possibly that child's full of people saying, well, what's your opinion on this? So if I felt it was actually going to be a pressure on the child mm -hmm. because they have other outlets, then I would I would not advise to do it. I wouldn't encourage it. Yeah, those are all very sensible reasons. Um, mm -hmm. I think before we wrap up, I'd love to get a, a, a concrete example from you of a success story. Um, you know, I, I know you can't share specific information about any of your cases, but could you tell us a story of when child mediation has particularly well worked? Oh, yes. Um, I think there was a few. I can't tell you specifics, as you said. Um, a really, really interesting one 
was speaking to um, children of university age. So actually they weren't under 18, but they were young yeah. adults. And often parents are really worried about kids at university. They are officially not kids, but they're still very much kids and they're still very much going to be coming home when they're in the holidays. So really good ones have been really sort of, I think have been impactful for the whole family as a whole have been when older children have been able to walk through with me. What's it gonna look like when I come home from uni? Um, I've got a girlfriend who lives near dad. I don't wanna hurt mom. You know, these kinds of um, thought processes that they need to kind of grapple with. So those have been really, really helpful. Actually, the success of that was working it through with the child and helping the child feel that shoulders coming down. Mm -hmm. I've managed to yeah. speak out of this. I don't know if it was as impactful for the parents and their settlement decisions. Yeah. Child found it really good. Well, um, that's always a benefit. <laughs> I think the ones that have been less easy successes are ones where children have said you can tell mum but don't tell dad or you can tell dad but not mum or you cannot tell my parents anything yeah that has in itself you know like a deep dark silence been so expressive to parents that we've then had to take time to think well where is your relationship right now and how can you think about building it yeah so that that child feels safe and comfortable to express themselves to you or to me for you you know for them to communicate so that has been probably not easy but, but very, very eye-opening <laughs> but, eye -opening, but I think successful I think a successful child inclusive mediation is when a child feels the ground has been new ground has been broken that we can really see a different landscape ahead for that child so that that's my most successful I mean I'm impartial as a mediator but I'm always partial to the child's feelings and voice and experience of the situation. Thank you Devorah. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today and to answer all my questions. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much Chloe it's been a pleasure. Take care. Okay.